Welcome to Commission 7 online annual meeting session number nine. The title of this session is Land Administration and the SDGs. Uh, we have several presentations prepared for today. This session will be recorded uh, and I would like to invite you to post your questions in the question and hour um, menu button. Uh, so welcome to do it there. Uh, and uh, the questions will be uh, answered at the end of the session. Um, if some of the presentations are shorter, maybe we can allow for one question, but in general, uh, at the end of the session. Um, so we will start with the first presentation for today, and it will be given by Professor Christian Lemon uh, and Eftihia Kaloliani. Um, I will give a little bit of uh, information about them. Professor Christian Lehmann is a geodetic advisor at Cadaster International in the Netherlands. And also he's working as a professor in land information modeling in University of Twente, ITC. And Eftihia, she's a PhD candidate in GIS technology section at the Faculty of Architecture and Built and, uh, Environment in TU Delft. Mm, so I would like to give the floor to them to present their um, work. Yeah. yeah th thank you, Mila. Uh, FTV, could you please share your screen? Then we can start with the presentation. Okay. So welcome uh, to this uh, presentation. It was prepared by me and as Mila said, by FTV Kaloujiani. But on, on behalf of the Land Administration Development uh, Team, uh, Peter van Oostrom, Abdullah van Atas, Agum, Peter Aukes, Abdullah and Anna Schneidman, and in cooperation with ISO, the International Standardization Organization and the Open Geospatial uh, Consortium. Can I have the next slide, please? I always like to start with this beautiful picture of our Planet. From this perspective, you cannot see what we are doing there. Uh, but let's say I'm from a country where we know that the amount of water, the area of water that you see here, will increase. And that means that we have less land. So more water, less land, less fertile river deltas. And next slide, please. At the other side, we have, we have more people. So the, the number of people is uh, growing. So the pressure on land is, is increasing, uh, less land and more people, and also more people with, with small pieces of land available for their use. Can I have the next slide, Efti, uh, here? Yeah, that's what you see here. Informal areas to the left, very, very small pieces of land. Uh, formalized area to the, to the right, uh, bigger pieces of land with gardens and so on. And if you look, then you can also see the wall in between those two areas. And the wall is not, not to avoid that, uh, let's say, the, the people from the formal areas uh, cannot can, uh, not go to the informal areas. It is the other way around. So if it, can I have the next slide, uh, FTV, please? Yeah. We talk about land, we talk about people, and we talk about relationships between people and land. And when it is about uh, support to the sustainable development goals and also with support of this land administration domain model, we talk about all people to land relationships. So it is not only the formal relations between people and land, but also customary relations, uh, all kind of restrictions uh, and so on. Uh, but also areas under, under dispute. So they, let's say with overlapping uh, claims, that is what you see with more people and less land uh, and drought and so on more and more. And all those relations can be modeled. And, and that's where we talk about now. Next slide, please. The sustainable development goals. And uh, with the support of land administration uh, domain model, we hope to provide a, a platform for decision making because achievement of the sustainable development goals means that a lot of decisions have to be made. Decisions require uh, information, accessible uh, information. In general, governments need information to, to govern. 
infrastructures information infrastructures need to be uh, established for further development with information about pl people places and uh, relations between people and uh, uh, places and that's where ldm comes in and that's where land administration domain model helps can i have the next slide uh, ftv so i miss one slide now can can i see the next one Ah, yeah, here we have the land administration domain model. So you can see the different uh, packages in green, that is information about uh, people, information and attributes about people. In yellow, information about rights, restrictions and responsibilities, the relations between people and land in blue, information about spatial uh, units. And uh, so that is the, the land parcels and, and uh, which we like to survey as uh, surveyors. There is a lot of flexibility in this uh, model and that allows, uh, let's say, the representation of all people to land relationships in a very flexible uh, way. So we don't have uh, just uh, uh, traditional parcels as, as representation of uh, places. But you can also use points and, 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 and lines in all kinds of configurations and, and other types of uh, spatial units. So it is a very, very flexible model and uh, it was uh, implemented, it was available in, in, uh, as a standard, international standard uh, since uh, 2012. Uh, but it is, uh, I think we can say that, that it is uh, successful because uh, FDVIA will, will present uh, not only some, some national country profiles, but also some examples of real implementations. So this means that this uh, standard is, uh, is really under, under adoption and more and more widely uh, used. Can I go to the next slide? So the land administration domain model is a model. It is not a land information system. It is a conceptual uh, model. It is a, in fact a knowledge uh, domain with knowledge of, uh, let's say, people, people to land, people to land relationship, land administration can represent formal and informal and customary uh, types of relationships. It can represent, of course, related to that formal right holders and informal and uh, customary right holders, as well as formal parcels as uh, informal and customary spatial units. So for those uh, domains, uh, customary and informal, we use this word spatial units because parcel is a, uh, as a, as a formal uh, level. Can we go to the next slide? So the edition one of the land administration domain model was launched in uh, 2012, as I said. And what ISO, the International Standardization Organization is doing, they, they evaluate uh, the standard every five or 10 years uh, to see if it still meets the requirements of its uh, users. And it was decided now that there will be a, a second edition will be developed of the land administration domain model based on the new requirements that arrive to, to FIG and to ISO from, from the users community. The second edition will be backwards compatible. So if you use the first one, then you uh, can still use it in the, from the second edition. And there will be new functionality. There will be attention to uh, taxation and valuation, to spatial planning, planning with all the related uh, restrictions to, to land use. There will uh, be attention to do the marine uh, cadaster and, and that is the subject of attention of FTVS presentation, a methodology of developing country profiles will be provided. And then we go to the 3D and 4D uh, aspects and, and also indoor information, uh, which has a cadastral component and the land administration com component uh, will be in the focus of attention. Uh, we also go to all kind of uh, encodings, so land XML, uh, land infra, and so on. And I think there will be a big discussion related to that. Can I go to the next slide, please? Yeah, here you see a nice uh, version of uh, LADM. That is what we call the social tenure domain model, which is available now in, in, uh, in many apps. Uh, has redeveloped uh, functionality based on, on this uh, model. So here we can also see that it is really, let's say, well understood and maybe for that reason successful. Can we go to the next slide? Yeah, that is my last slide uh, before we go to FTVIA. 
the, the, the LEDM edition two will be a multi-part development. So it is not one part as the, the edition one. There will be one part about uh, land administration fundamentals. Uh, that is under development now. Part two, land registration. I think uh, we will invite, we will ask FIG to submit a new working item proposal to, to ISO for the development of that uh, part with involvement, involvement of the registrars and the, the surveyors. Part three will be about the marine space. Uh, part four, with the valuation community. Uh, within FIG, but also outside uh, FIG about the uh, land valuation. Part five, that is really a big community behind that about spatial planning. And part six about uh, real implementations. And that is where the, the OGG standards come in. So we will have a, develop a cooperation also with the Open Geospatial Consortium. So this is what I would like to say as an introduction to FTVS presentation. So maybe you can take over from here, FTGA. Thank you, Chris. Um, hello, everyone. I will continue by giving you an overview of the LADM, LADM developments at an international level till today, so since 2012. And uh, there are various LADM-based country profiles that have been developed, but there are also some jurisdictions and countries that uh, go one step uh, beyond the conceptualization of uh, a model based on LADM. Here we should say that the role of industry is very important because uh, LADM is gaining ground and many big companies around the world recognize the need to provide solutions based or compliant with LADM. While at the geospatial community, there are multiple standards that uh, even they are developed now or they are under revision, such as S121 or CPGML, the third version that was released now, and the revision of InfraGML that um, are aligned with LADM. So they take into account LADM to provide compatible um, models with this one uh, to achieve interoperability. Of course, in this scene, the close collaboration between ISO and OGC, where also LADM revision lies, is uh, very important because uh, the second edition aims to go beyond the conceptual model and provide tools and methodologies for actual implementation of the model. FIG has an important role, of course, and uh, we can even say that this is a success of FIG that uh, supports LADM activities since. Uh, much more before 2012 actually, and with a series of LADM workshops and where we can see the number of participants increasing and also participants from all over the world that they present uh, the developments uh, that they have made towards uh, the adaptation of LADM in multiple levels in their countries is very important. So we can say that uh, uh, those developments uh, mostly are driven from the academia sector, uh, but now the last years we keep seeing also governmental organizations and uh, land administration organizations that are involved in the domain of land administration and industry to have a more um, practice ro practical role if you want. And uh, we don't have to forget that LA LADM does not aim to replace the existing system, but uh, provides tools and a conceptual model, uh, a third vocabulary and ontology in order to up upgrade those uh, LAS, modernize them, establish new ones where we do not uh, have uh, already operational systems and facilitate the, um, the exchange and the communication uh, of information related to land administration, both at national levels, but also internationally, which is very important. So to give you an idea, uh, when LADM was voted in 2012 as an ISO standard, in this edition, edition one in Annex D, there were eight country profiles uh, that were included. Today, you can see that the number increases a lot. You can see also the, the same, um, uh, countries with uh, 2012. Some of them have, have already revised their initial model. And um, this is uh, really nice to see because all those developments prove the flexibility of the model, as Chris also mentioned before. Because we can see that the LADM is uh, adapted even at the conceptual level, so trying to develop a LADM based country profile. Uh, in different 
types of land administration systems worldwide. So LADM supports uh, titles, uh, uh, deeds, strata titles, and all kinds um, of uh, such systems. And if we go to the actual implementations, um, I should notice here that uh, the overview that I'm presenting is a work in progress. So now you see where we are today. This uh, is the list, if you want, of the countries that we have uh, till now. And we expect to have a better overview next year in the FIG working week or even later. And uh, I do believe that uh, this list with the country implementations would be much more enriched because here we can see, for example, the registers of Scotland that uh, they adopted the LADM and they are based the whole system in LADM, which is a, a huge uh, achievement for the standard. Also, Malaysia has implemented the 3D database based on LADM to move from two-dimensional to three-dimensional system. Uh, Indonesia also uh, provides a whole, uh, has developed a, a whole ecosystem of tools for field uh, collection, data collection. Inspired cadastral parcels are based in uh, LADM. What is more, there are several countries, for example, Czech Republic, that they adopt LADM and publish it at, as a national standard. And there we have some translations, apart from the official ISO languages, so English and French, who have translation in Spanish, Czech, Chinese, Korean, and Russian. Here to see some more country implementations, and uh, Honduras was uh, one of the first countries that implemented actually LADM in 2013, Serbia and Montenegro, also trying uh, the 3D part uh, support of the LADM. Colom Colombia has developed a whole ecosystem of tools, while Singapore has uh, focused on one part, so on the utility mapping and and modeling the utility network of uh, their country. And of course, industry. Uh, here, again, I would say that this is work in progress. Uh, if we have more um, uh, companies that are that support the LADM and provide the LADM-based solution, this list should be enriched. But of course, Edgely provides LADM services. Uh, IGN and Cadastra have already um, been uh, involved in many projects around the world uh, where LADM implementation is uh, the scope of the project. As Grit mentioned before, the SDDM is, uh, provides uh, open software uh, solutions for LADM implementation. So based on all those and the analysis that we are making on uh, all the country profiles that we select we said that okay now we have enough knowledge to base the next uh, revision to see what is really being implemented from this model and uh, what should be improved what are the needs and the requirements so we assess the the country profiles with some criteria i'm not going to spend my time here this i just wanted to show you it's a joint work uh, which is in progress, but I will only focus on the good practices that um, we distilled from this work is that it is crucial to involve the stakeholder, stakeholders in the whole process of developing and testing the country profile. First of all, in the conceptual level, but also to validate it through the technical implementation and the real world cases. Training and dissemination of the profile is very important, and uh, this would be also added in the second edition. And the versioning of the country profiles, meaning that some, profi some countries have already developed uh, the first version of their profile, and now they upgrade this one uh, to meet the new requirements. So Crit has already described uh, the part. I just wanted to show you where we are now. So the new working item proposal for the first part has been submitted and accepted last month. Now we are in progress of developing the new working guided proposal that SIG will submit. But the focus uh, of this presentation is on part six, so the implementation, where also the methodology, some general guidelines of the methodology of how to develop country profiles uh, will be included. And to give you a brief overview, uh, based on uh, current experience and knowledge, we decided to propose uh, three main phases of the country profile development. And it should be noticed that this methodology is quite uh, flexible, so it can apply to all kinds of land administration systems, to the different maturity level of the land administration systems, 
uh, even if we have a very well established or not very well operational or not at all um, systems, we can use this methodology. So the first phase is to define the scope. So to identify all the contributors, the stakeholders that will be involved um, in the progress and they will give their input. Then it's very important to decide the scope. So if this uh, profile would depict the current situation, which is uh, for us important that the first version of the profile should depict the situation as it is today. And then we can have another version uh, depicting the future expectations. So a bigger, um, a bigger picture of uh, what the land administration system should support. And of course, the analysis of the current system and the needs and the national strategy, the vocabulary and the code list should be included in the first uh, phase. You may also see from the diagram that this uh, process, even between the phases, but also the different steps of each phase, is very interactive. So it is a loop uh, until we get uh, a satisfactory, if you want, um, result. So having a map, the existing situation, and we do know who will be involved in this uh, development. The, the country profile should be developed um, at a conceptual level. First of all, if there is an existing model, the existing classes should be mapped with LADM classes and concepts. And please note that this is not one-to-one -one, uh, relationship. Sometimes many classes from the existing model map LADM or there are no classes that map an LADM class. And this is uh, the inspiring thing of the modeling process, I would say. And then we develop the UML model, uh, the conceptual model in UML diagrams, populate the code list uh, with uh, the needs of each country and perform the conformity test to see in which level of conformance we are uh, according to annex A of the first edition of LADM. And uh, the real testing is at the last phase, of course. So collect the real data. This is why we do want stakeholders to be involved from the first uh, phase of the country profile development, develop the instance level diagrams at conceptual level, populate the database, which, we, which will be based and compliant with LADM, and then visualize the results in 2D, in 3D, in desktop or in web, and of course, you know that uh, when you test, you have to go back uh, and remodel again uh, what you think that does not work as you want. So to summarize the uh, presentations, both grids and mine presentation, um, I think that current developments really, really show and prove the international recognition of LADM and that there are more and more countries that uh, they are interested in adopting LADM, for example, Morocco was not in the list that you saw before, but um, we, we talked with the authors of the profile and they are really working on towards the implementation. So the multi-part edition, the new one is a challenging progress, which is currently under development. It involves main, many stakeholders and uh, it, it will take uh, some time also to, to to submit the new working item proposals. Uh, it includes valuation, spatial planning, marine, place, marine spaces, and the implementation. So uh, this overview uh, is still in progress. If you have an input, uh, it will be really nice to hear from you if uh, you didn't see any country yet that it speaks to be listed there. And the methodology for country profiles uh, also will be in addition to Ophelidium. Thank you for both of us. Thank you very much. Uh, great presentation, Krit and Eftihir. Thank you very much. Uh, you. It's uh, really on time. Uh, and I see that there are some uh, questions for you. However, I would prefer to leave them to the end of the session uh, okay. since, uh, yeah, it was to keep our timing. Uh, so now I would um, like to introduce you the second presentation for our session. Uh, it will be the presentation for Cadaster, Cadaster and its um, reflection on the SDGs. It will be given by Frank Pichel and Amy uh, Battencourt. Uh, so Amy is currently a Chief Executive Officer of Cadaster. And um, Frank is a Land Administration Specialist and Chief Program Officer of, uh, of Cadaster. And uh, he has been working for a lot of years in international land systems. 
So I will give them the floor to continue on their presentation and to share with us how do they respond to the SDGs. Welcome. Hello, everyone. This is Amy Kokenauer, and it's a pleasure to be here. It's actually my first FIG meeting, so it's, it's really great to be a part of it. So thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to just start by mentioning that uh, two, two and a half years ago when I joined Cadasta, um, I was really excited about it because I worked previously in the area of agricultural development and food security, working with smallholder farmers around the world. And <clears throat> my observations from that work in working with cooperatives and smallholder farmers and women <clears throat> in the field is that the issue of land was always a problem. And we would invest hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, donor monies, uh, <clears throat> to implement all kinds of improved agricultural practices, resilience measures, um, uh, and other kinds of uh, other kinds of activities to improve incomes uh, and improve uh, smallholder farmer outcomes and agriculture. And so, but the issue was that so many of those folks did not own their own land, uh, did not have rights to the land, and um, it it really struck me over, over all those years of working in this space that how much land was left off the table in these interventions. And so um, after working for, I don't know, a decade and a half in that space, um, I was really excited to come over to Cadasta to, that, that, to address these issues um, globally through partners and networks working in the space. So um, Frank, you can, Advance the slide, please, thanks. So uh, our mission as an organization and our vision really focuses on um, the understanding that uh, secure land tenure and resource rights advances, um, uh, not only does it advance to tenure on the ground for people, but it also affords additional benefits um, for communities with secure tenure. And the evidence shows that, you know, educational, nutritional, income, outcome, all of those outcomes are clear uh, when tenure is strengthened. And so uh, we focus on serving as a partner to organizations on the ground as a technical partner, a technology partner, and uh, focusing on not only documentation, but securing of land and resource rights to build stronger communities. So uh, next. So I just want to share, and, and this is not news to anyone in, the, in, this, in this call, that uh, we were created really to, to fill a gap in the system, which is these failed top-down systems, um, particularly failing vulnerable communities and their access to secure tenure and land services, and also to fill gaps, not only in, in documentation, but in data, uh, technology gaps, and um, resource gaps. And so um, these are these are some of the issues that uh, drove the creation of, of Cadasta. And actually, Frank, my colleague, is a, is a co-founder of the organization. Um, but really looking at how do we provide services on the ground to partners uh, to advance and enable their work in this space, whether they're working in agriculture, in urban settlements, or for example, on community or indigenous land um, claims. So this, this graphic here just kind of shows where we are in the space. Um, and we consider ourselves sort of bridging gaps in data and capacity around, around land and property rights documentation. So if the top down systems on the top of the slide um, are inefficient and high cost and, and aren't keeping up with the needs in the field, uh, at the same time, they're also focused on standards, as we just heard. Um, you know, they are the official record. Governments still have the purview of formalizing and recognizing land rights. At the bottom of the graphic, you see sort of the community-based efforts. There's a lot of bottom-up community mapping going on where you have local trust and community participation at a low cost using local knowledge. 
At the same time, a lot of those efforts aren't based on standards. They tend to be more informal. Um, they, often, uh, they often lack strategies to secure data. Um, sometimes the gender pieces are challenging due to local customs um, and practices. And also it's just sort of fragmented actors and tools out there uh, doing this community-based mapping. So what we're trying to do in this space is, is bridge the gap between those two by providing a standards-based platform and approach um, that is STDM compliant uh, and also providing uh, uh, technical assistance and, and consulting services for partners on the ground to support the uh, creation of data models and, and, and technology solutions to help bridge the gap in land documentation and securing of tenure. Um, the some of the, the Cadessa platform, and this is kind of a picture of the suite, it's, it's mobile applications on the ground as um, was mentioned earlier, uh, we do build our tools on an Esri technology stack that is LDAM uh, compliant. Uh, and it's also a set of visualization and, and analytical tools that our partners use to support their work. And some of the benefits of the platform that we like to share uh, and, and talk to our partners about so that they can fully access the benefits is that the platform is scalable. It is a robust technology stack that can be scaled. And in fact, uh, we have scaled it to doc documenting over 2.5 million people around the world. Um, it is a secure technology stack. It is interoperable with government land information systems. It's, we're also making it accessible for communities to and partners on the ground uh, at a low cost uh, or no cost. It's also very flexible uh, and can be applied to almost any use case. For example, I mentioned we focus on urban settlements rural farms and community or customary land. Uh, intersectoral, as mentioned, and also the provision of additional tools beyond just mobile data collection. It's helping partners uh, use the data to advance their, their land objectives as well as their development objectives, depending on what sector they're working in. Next. Uh, this is just a, a, a screenshot of the Cadasta Impact Dashboard. Um, it shows a roll up of the data, even though we're very clear that we don't own our partner data, we are able to roll up anonymized data to show the scope, uh, both quantitative and qualitative. This is just the, the, the front page of our um, dashboard. You can go in there, it's interactive. You can click on the maps and look at different country. You can look at, you can search it by use case uh, and you can uh, see the partners that are operating there. We allow our partners to select their privacy levels. So not all projects show names and, and uh, polygons or you know uh, project details, for example. But it does show you here um, the progress that we're making in terms of scaling the platform globally. We're working in 32 countries with 64 partners. And as I said earlier, we have documented over two and a half million uh, people's rights on the platform across those different use cases that I mentioned. Also, there, if you go into this on our website at cadasta.org, you can also see some qualitative evaluation data showing um, feedback, uh, third party impact evaluations on the impact that this, uh, that our work and our partners work is having on community beneficiaries. Uh, this is the last piece that I will uh, mention and then I'll pass it over to Frank. We're gonna talk a, a little bit about um, how we see this work on the ground with partners contributing to the SDGs. and. We, we lay out uh, the five different F SDGs that we're focused on and giving, and Frank will give some examples of each of these on the ground and how we see this work contributing broadly to the achievement of the SDGs in the land space. So Frank, it's over to you. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much for that, Amy. Um, so as noted, we're going to dive a little bit into some of the, the kind of concrete project examples, but I think just important to note generally that 
at Cadasta, we, we really work to align our, our partners' projects and data collection with data standards and existing indexes. Um, because with, with those data standards, whether it's STDM or a national LADM-based model, we know that increases the likelihood of, of a maturation of data and some sort of formal recognition. On the other hand, aligning with indexes such as Prindex, Landex, or the SDGs while we're collecting data can really give a, a window into how that particular community, region, partner we're working with, how the land rights are, are managed locally and how that compares you know, broadly um, within the region, but also internationally. Um, so, and also I think beginning to think about how we can feed that data back up, particularly into say Prindex or Landex, where there are not that many, you know, data points that inform uh, um, those indexes. So we're going to dive a, a, a bit further into a couple of projects. As we all know, there wasn't a clear top line land indicator, which I sure we probably were all disappointed in as we all I'm sure recognize property rights as a, uh, an underlying critical component of development. But that said, while there might not have been a top line uh, property rights indicator in the SDGs, there, there's surely land issues peppered uh, throughout. So we're just gonna dive into some examples that I think from a Cadasta perspective tied into some of those key SDGs. The first one being, you know, no poverty and specifically looking to ensure equal rights to economic resources, uh, including control and ownership of land. And the project uh, for me that really um, um, highlights this role is, is working in the Odisha state, uh, uh, India, where as part of the Jaga mission, we've been supporting efforts to turn slums into livable habitats. Um, and largely using slum dwellers associations as the data collectors and cadasta tools tied with drone imagery to collect a massive amount of data, you know, over a million, um, well, over uh, 180,000 households now, over a million people. But realizing that that's just a first step. So these households are, are achieving a right uh, for the first time. But the first step there is that it's leading to other things. Odisha mission, is, uh, the, the Jaga mission is looking at this data being collected as, again, infrastructure to help inform the next step. How do we provide water, sanitation, lights, road widening, et cetera, and ultimately delist these communities as slums and now into parts of the, commu uh, parts of the community. And we're excited to see that massive amount of data collected over the last three years and leading to now about 120,000 uh, land records issued. The zero hunger. So this really looking at agricultural productivity and doubling that of small scale food producers. And, and as, as we all know, a lot of the uh, rural projects tie directly into food security. One that we're working with, um, with NCBA Clusa in Mozambique actually ties not just the property rights, but also the livelihood activities. And it, it's gonna be interesting to really look at, at how, how that's addressed when we do just one intervention, i.e. property rights, another intervention, livelihoods, or combine the two. And excited to have the World Bank's Gender Innovation Lab doing an impact evaluation on that project. So coming, uh, look, we can look forward to some very interesting data, but probably a couple of years out. Just um, one to tie into the, the gender equality. We've had a, quite a few projects that have been specifically targeted at gender issues. Um, one that comes to mind is in Colombia. We're working with Aso Manos Negros uh, our tools have been used by Afro-Colombian communities and women's group within them to map those community boundaries, to compare those maps to what's being titled and where they are in the titling process, but also to create, um, you know, private maps of customary and religious, uh, of mapping areas of customary and religious significance. So we're seeing how that same data is being used in different ways, you know, for tracking, for advocacy, uh, for comparing to where they are in the government processes, but also with that uh, community participatory mapping using similar technology, same databases, but, but only allowing the relevant actors to see the data appropriate to them. And recognizing we're, we're going to probably a bit short on time, I'll, I'll try to hustle through these, these last few, but sustainable cities and communities, it, um, you know, really ties to, to uh, urban issues for us. Um, 
and, and looking at how we can en enhance inclusive and sustainable urbanization. And there's a project we've been quite active on in Haiti. We're partnered with Habitat for Humanity and supported by USAID. We've been working with municipal governments to document households. Um, there, there's quite a bit of confusion and challenges in the formal sector. In the meantime, uh, municipalities are stuck. Mayors need data to deliver services, to understand where their constituency is, to collect revenue. Um, and they can't wait for the, the, the a titling process to continue. Um, so in that context, we've mapped about 23,000 households. That data is now being used by the municipal mayor's offices um, and is also being tracked for the formal, uh, formal tenure security. I think most interesting is what we're seeing is the neighboring communities are now coming on asking if they can join the trainings that are being offered as part of this USAID project because they've had they've had the same challenge. They've been using paper-based tools and they're seeing what the power of technology can do and aligning it with these data standards. So we're now adding other communes that weren't officially part of this USAID project into the database. So I'll just jump uh, jump towards the end here, recognizing I'm, I'm probably over time now, but really looking at what the impact is. Um, and we recently did an impact evaluation in Odisha State and, and seeing how uh, maybe just that top line perception of tenure security. You know, what did people think? And seeing how before the mapping and formalization occurred, 75% said they were very worried. And six months later, saying that that 75, 74% uh, now saying that worry has decreased. So that mapping and, and just starting the formalization process already leading to a change in perception and now change in behaviors. So I'll stop there, but thank you all very much for your time today. Um, and we'll look forward to any questions afterwards. Thank you thank very you. much, uh, Frank and Amy. Very interesting presentation. Uh, actually, you were quite on time. <laughs> I was trying to think how to give you a sign not to stop because the slides were quite interesting and colorful. Uh. <laughs> but okay, we had a fast glance through them. Uh, maybe they will inspire more questions to the end of our session. Mm, okay, so now we will go to the next uh, presenter for today. It's a pleasure for me to introduce you, Paula Dijkster. Uh, and she will talk about uh, fit for purpose land administration and SDGs. I think most of you know Paula, but I will show to introduce her. She's a director of Cadaster International, and she's responsible for the coordination of Cadaster International activities and international cooperation projects. So Paula, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Mila, for introducing me and um, good day. Uh, to you all. It's really a pleasure to feel the international uh, vibe again after uh, yeah, missing uh, international events in spring, summer and autumn um, this year for obvious reasons. Um, and it was really nice to participate already in a few sessions and to um, learn from other presentations and it really provided already some good food for thought. Um, so really a big uh, shout out to Daniel Paez for organizing this event and the organization team for uh, setting this up. I think a really good opportunity to be and feel connected with our community um, again. Um, today I will tell um, a little bit more from the Commission 7 perspective on Fit for Purpose Land Administration. I will take you a little bit back into what has uh, done before, before concluding with the ideas of what uh, FIG Commission 7 and you can do uh, towards um, uh, fit for purpose land administration and achieving, uh, contributing to achieving uh, the SDGs. Rowan, you will be driving the slides uh, for me as I understood. So um, please, the next uh, uh, slide. Um, as highlighted also in the previous presentations, um, we have the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development to leave no one behind. It's translated in 17 sustainable development goals um, with targets and indicators. Um, for each of the commissions, they are different. For Commission 7, they are strongly linked to the land administration and the need to accelerate efforts to document and record 
and recognize people-to-land relationships in all forms. And this requires um, uh, solutions that meet the needs of the people and their relationships. It needs fit-for-purpose approaches to accommodate to the local uh, context, to the specific context in each country. Next slide, please. So within FIG, um, there's always been a tension. There's a car passing by, I hope you couldn't hear it, but uh, anyway. <laughs> so um, within FIG, there's always been a tension to improve tenure security and the role of the surveyor um, uh, to contribute to that, to improve that. Um, now with the SDGs, uh, there's also a responsibility for FIG to raise awareness on the relevance of the SDGs. Um, we've seen it in the pres previous presentations, there are strong SDGs linked to land, but there are also some uh, specific SDGs uh, for certain commissions. For instance, for Commission 4 uh, on hydrography, there's a, there are a different set of SDGs uh, important, and that's where FIG has a role. Commission 7 will focus on the uh, land indicators um, and to see how we can contribute uh, there. And there's a link also from the Commission to the FIG task force on uh, the SDGs. So for today, next slide, please, Rowan. So for today, I wanted to use these three uh, um, location as a starting point um, because these key documents have, in my opinion, be key drivers uh, of improving tenure security um, in our domain. In 2014, the, 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 the concept of fit for purpose land administration uh, was, um, was presented in the uh, publication from World Bank and FIG with key authors, uh, Stieg Enemark, Keith Bell, um, uh, Robin McLaren and Stieg Ain uh, and Crit Lemon. Um, that presented the concept of what this profession can do um, to uh, improve tenure security. Uh, in a fit for purpose way. Uh, of course, the 2030 agenda, which I already mentioned. And then in 2016, um, the guiding principles were launched. It's a publication from UN Habitat and GLTN together with Cadaster um, with uh, the principal authors, uh, Stieg Enemark, Robin McLaren and um, Crit Lemon. And there you have the foundation of more knowledge on how we can as a profession contribute to tenure security and land rights um, for all. So this was for me a big push towards um, yeah, fit for purpose land administration. Next slide, please. So if you look towards Commission 7 in the past years, in the past terms as well, a fit for purpose land administration has been, um, um, has been an, an attention point in the commission. There's been a working group dedicated towards fit for purpose land administration. Also in the working week in 2019 in Hanoi, um, Rudolf Steiger um, presented on the fit for purpose land administration in relation to the 2030 agenda, indicating yes, the, the goals are ambitious targets. There's not enough time and money for a classical cadaster. Faster solutions are needed. Um, and we need to really speed up to learn from what has been uh, done on the ground. We need to collect the best practices and examples and textbooks. So that's where uh, Commission 7 specifically is looking for, to offer this platform for stakeholders, to be a link between stakeholders and to build on the capacity for fit for purpose land administration. At the end of my presentation, I will, you will uh, see what our plans are for the, for the coming uh, time in this uh, term. Um, next slide, please. So in the um, uh, working group, uh, in the work plan of uh, Commission 7, and specifically in the work plan of uh, working group 7.2, focusing on uh, fit for purpose implementation, it is indicate what we will focus on. In the past uh, terms, uh, there was a focus on, on developing the approach um, and, um, uh, and to uh, underline the importance of uh, fit for purpose led administration. But now we need more attention to learn from the methods and ap uh, approaches that were used um, and to learn from how uh, different solutions can work in different situations. And we have a role as commission to collect these experiences and lessons learned from projects around the world. Um, next slide, please. And the idea was, of course, to have a session uh, in Amsterdam uh, during the FIG Working Week 2020 
for obvious reasons, uh, this was canceled. Uh, but that would have been a nice opportunity to bring together these stakeholders and to have a good discussion on what has been um, uh, developed and happening on the ground with uh, the implementation of fit for purpose uh, land administration projects to discuss the pros and cons from the practical implementations. Um, and the idea was to document that in, into a publication. Um, that opportunity uh, was not, it's not there anymore, so we had to refigure what we can do. Um, and I will get back to that at the end of the presentation, because for now I would like to also share with you some other important updates um, on the uh, Fit for Purpose Land Administration implementations. Next slide, please. In the beginning of this year, um, a new guide was launched for Fit for Purpose Land Administration. Uh, it's called uh, Fit for Purpose Land Administration for All, written uh, by uh, Eva Maria Unger and Rowan Bennett. And it's a guide for surveyors on the adoption and adaptation of Fit for Purpose Land Administration. And it's a really nice hands-on uh, guide where you find answers to present questions uh, towards the implementation of FFPLA. Um, it, it gives indications on how you as a surveyor can contribute to the implementation um, as well as to the achievement of the SDGs and it unpacks the opportunities in different settings for instance in a post-conflict issue or where there are climate uh, changes uh, occurring um, you will find examples in this um, document. I chose to highlight one aspect um, of it. Next slide please. This is about the private sector imperative. What you see often with the implementation of fit for purpose land administration um, projects is there is uh, work going on at, um, uh, at top down where there's the, the donors are working together with the national governments to encourage uh, the initiatives um, on the ground to collect uh, information and to start with the uh, documentation of the people to land relationships. Um, but the, 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 the bridge or the gap between these national uh, uh, activities and, and, the, and, and the local activities, there's, um, yeah, that can be strengthened. And um, in the guide, there's um, described how the private um, uh, sector can have a role in that. It is also linking to the PPPs, the, the public-private um, partnerships, uh, where there's really a role um, where uh, private uh, um, companies can um, can step in. And I think the presentation just now from um, Amy and Frank already indicated how they see, uh, how they look towards their role in this, yeah, in this gap um, between that. Um, looking further, next slide please, um, to the country implementations, we can see that since 2016, there's been an increase of implementations with fit for purpose uh, land administration concept being applied. Um, often these experiences are shared during conferences and meetings like uh, the World Bank uh, Land and Poverty Conference, the FIG Working Weeks, GLTN partner meetings, etc. Um, what we see is there are um, different issues returning um, when the experience are being shared, it's about the sustainable maintenance of the data. Once it's collected, how do you maintain it and keep it up to date uh, with, the, with, with changes? How do you scale up? Uh, how do you go from a pilot uh, approach to really um, creating volume in documenting uh, these relationships? And what can be done into the incremental improvement um, in the continuum of land rights? So for the, the commission perspective, it's really interesting to see if there are similarities when you implement in different places and in different contexts. Are there patterns that can be identified and how can these patterns help with further development um, uh, for achievement to achieve land rights for all? Um, and, and that's where uh, Commission 7 and Working Group 7.2 can really have a role to gather these um, examples. Um, next slide, please. So this is a draft slide. Please keep that in mind. It's a draft slide where I tried to gather all the uh, experiences of fit for purpose land administration uh, uh, implementations that have been documented or presented uh, during um, different conferences. 
um, it most likely is not complete. Uh, so I invite you as participant, if you are missing um, uh, countries um, that are not here on the map, please let me know and then, then we can take that into account. Um, but it shows where at this moment there have been uh, implementations going on using the fit for purpose uh, land administration concept. Um, and I will highlight a few of them. Next slide, please. The first one is the Colombian project Lent in Peace. Um, it's a, a Dutch Colombian cooperation uh, to formalize and register land in the post conflict regions, um, um, together with also uh, private sector support of ESRI and Trimble. The, the, the data has been uh, collected um, uh, on the ground um, using grassroots uh, surveyors and um, uh, at, yeah, it's also happening in a quite uh, challenging uh, institutional setting. So that's where really bottom up and top down approach are really linked uh, with each other to accept also the, the, the data that has been collected on the ground. One aspect that I wanted to highlight in this presentation is also this manual for grassroots surveyors, which can really be a good inspiration for other projects that are um, implementing uh, fit for purpose land administration solutions um, that can be used. Next slide, please. Um, the Nepal, where the, the where fit for purpose was applied in the post disaster uh, context in the earthquake recovery um, that occurred in 2015, um, and where the concept was applied in different pilot settings and is now being continued. And there, I also would like to highlight two uh, publications. Uh, the first one is uh, the um, uh, country level implementation strategy for Nepal. Um, it's a, um, a nationally adopted strategy on how to um, um, implement fit for purpose administration solutions. And I think this can be a really good um, example or inspiration if um, you are working in a country um, uh, to set up um, a land policy plan or an implementation plan uh, for fit for purpose land administration. It is, um, yeah, it's really focused on, on the context of Nepal, but the descriptions and the chapters and the way it's set up can be really uh, be a good source of inspiration. The other document, the other publication um, there is, is focusing on um, the tools and technologies that were used in the three pilots. Uh, the three pilots had different context uh, settings, uh, so therefore also really worthwhile to learn from uh, what was applied in these uh, uh, settings. Next slide, please. Um, then uh, Benin, where um, they are now in the phase of setting up a national land administration system. Uh, currently, 60,000 out of 5 million parcels are not formally registered. So the, um, uh, the project there that's ongoing is focusing on fit for purpose land administration approaches. And similar to Colombia, for both Benin and Colombia, they are uh, linking uh, to the country-based uh, LADM profile which is a really good thing to see and also a valuable lesson learned. learned um, what can we see, can we see patterns uh, in, if, from these examples from Colombia and Benin, for instance. Next slide, please. Uh, Indonesia, uh, it's focusing on the participatory approach. I expect Simon uh, to present more on this because this is an example of Meridia. Uh, as a private partner uh, involved in this project um, where um, uh, there was um, cooperation uh, with the uh, government in Indonesia to map all land parcels in 2025 and where um, a participative land registration um, uh, approach was uh, piloted. Um, next slide, please. And um, here the example of Mozambique, where multiple partners uh, are working on fit for purpose land administration. And that's where I think we can learn uh, and, and bring together uh, lessons learned within the FIG community uh, to see what uh, the lessons learned and observations were from Cadasta working on the ground and collecting data 
and um, uh, learning from Cadastro what they were doing at national level to train and increase capacity um, at national level on fit for purpose land administration approaches. Um, so I know there are many more examples where there have been multiple partners working in different settings. And that's where I think that FRG um, has this um, uh, uh, responsibility and opportunity to bring together these, um, these experiences. Next slide, please. So this is an aspect of a, it's not a country example, but uh, valuable to share. Um, it's, it's an overview of uh, innovative geospatial tools for fit for purpose land rights recording developed uh, in the project It's for Land. It's a cooperation with um, academia partners uh, with, led by University of uh, Twente ITC faculty together with KU Leuven uh, and with private sector uh, involvement where they developed uh, six new tools to make uh, uh, land rights uh, mapping faster, cheaper, easier, and more responsible. So definitely worthwhile to have a look there to see what they developed and if that could be applied um, in, 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 in the countries you are uh, working on. Same goes for, uh, next slide, please. Then um, the academic or, or same goes for the, the publications um, related to fit for purpose land administration um, uh, applications. Uh, here's the example that's of a journal that's already been published, uh, remote sensing for land administration. And it contains a few um, uh, articles on fit for purpose land uh, administration uh, using remote sensing um, in the fields. Uh, there are already several, you know, there are several examples that have used the satellite imagery. So this is um, uh, giving you further access to information, how this was done um, and, and what you can take out of this for the application um, in, in, in your situation. And then next slide, please. Um, there's also an upcoming uh, uh, land journal uh, focusing on FFBLA uh, with the editors, uh, Stieg Enemark, Robin McLaren and Crit uh, Lemon. Um, and the deadline is uh, 31st of December. So still time for you to indicate uh, your interest uh, to contribute to this uh, journal and to include your article. Um, and it's focusing on different aspects of um, the implementations. So um, what you see is there is more and more information available. Um, and um, next slide, please. And the aim for FRG Commission 7, especially Workgroup 7.2, is to work towards the publication where experiences and results are collected. To reflect on what happened after uh, publication 60 was published in 2014, uh, to collect and share best implementation practices from different perspectives, not only geographical regions, but also from different stakeholder perspectives and different uh, contexts. Is it an urban or rural setting? Is it post-conflict? Is it climate issues involved, etc.? cetera? Um, so that is uh, something that we would like to see collected in this um, publication. Um, and we will describe the lessons learned. Um, based on interviews with the people who are working in these uh, projects. Um, it would be really interesting to see if we can identify these uh, patterns um, and um, how we can enhance the alignment of the initiatives with the 2030 agenda and most importantly define pathways within FRG to further accelerate um, efforts to document, record and recognize people to land relationships in all forms. And therefore, um, I would like to invite you, next and last slide, please, um, to volunteer to FRG with your uh, experience and to really uh, advocate for yourself as to being an FFPLA hero, um, to bring forward your experiences, to let us know um, uh, what, your, uh, what your experiences were. Um, uh, so yeah, please uh, drop a line, um, and um, yeah, we would be happy to include your um, your lessons learned in this uh, publication, uh, and also to think with us um, uh, and how we can use these experiences uh, for the work of FRG Commission Seven. Thank you, and um, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Paula. Very nice presentation. Uh, very intriguing. I think that uh, maybe there will be questions to the end of our session. Um, I want to add something. I cannot kind of stay silent. I saw on uh, your slide the example of the remote sensing special issue. It was a very successful one. Just to say that we started a new, a new one, a continuation. So there is plenty of time for those that would like to submit more papers in this special issue. And I would like to use this opportunity to invite you. By the next year, you, there is a lot of time. Good, thank you very much. Uh, and I would like to continue with the last presenter for today's session. Uh, it is again from a private sector. It is from uh, Meridia. Uh, his name uh, is uh, Simon Ovu. And uh, he's a co-founder of the company, uh, a vendor that seeks to help uh, landholders unlock the value of their land by providing them uh, land documentation services and obtain legal land title at scale. Uh, so it's a pleasure for me to give you the floor, Simon, and to take you through your presentation. Thank you. Uh, really appreciate that, Mila. Thank you for the welcome and thanks um, uh, for, for having us here at, at FIG. Um, I think it's, it's really nice uh, and I'd like to echo uh, Paula's sentiment that uh, it's good to be, to be gathered and to, to have a sense of community um, despite everything that's going on in the world. So thanks for that. Yeah, so um, I'd like to share a little bit about what Meridia does and how we go about it. Um, and more specifically, since the focus of today is, is more on the SDGs, uh, to talk about a specific sort of line of business that we have uh, working with um, food, food and agricultural value chains. Uh, but um, yeah, starting out, so a little bit about us. Uh, we, we started out uh, in 2015 uh, in, in Ghana, trying to develop a land tenure solution uh, that could work across different types of, uh, of tenure, customary um, through to official deeds and all the way to title. Um, and really be sort of like a multidisciplinary, if you will, uh, technology. Uh, we quickly learned that uh, the technology was not the hard part. In fact, um, um, yeah, I mean, now it's, I'm not the CTO, my co-founder is, but he kind of hates I say this, but uh, you know, the technology is really the easier part because uh, the hard part is the social solutions, the partnerships that we have to build and really understanding how things work on the ground. Um, but I'll get into that in a second. Uh, so, um, We've been focused really on building uh, something that's affordable and something that's scalable. Um, when we entered into to the market, we, we, we saw there are many solutions out there, uh, some really geared towards smaller initiatives, um, you could say very local community work. And at the top end, you have these big uh, international solutions, uh, which require some kind of top-down government implementation. And we felt that there was a big gap and particularly when you're looking at smallholder farmers, they tend to sort of sit right in there. Uh, they're, they're really reached uh, with, with either of those solutions and certainly not, not at scale. And, and they're often the last to be, to, to be mapped and, and get their land tenure altogether. Um, we also originally started out selling documents directly to smallholders uh, in Ghana uh, in a B2C model. Uh, which we came to regret after two or three years um, as it required enormous amounts of, of sort of uh, financial capacity to do that. And so we decided to, to take another route a few years ago and really look at who could we partner with where we can add our competence in, in our, on the technology side, as well as our ability to operate in the field uh, so that we actually can get um, the, the, the smallholder communities in particular, uh, the land tenure they need. So, uh, well, how do we go about this? Well, really, uh, we're all about uh, trying to understand the context within which we operate. It's like an absolute essential thing for us. Um, so uh, we try and seek collaboration with the communities, uh, the farming communities we're working with through uh, various types of stakeholders. Um, and uh, with that in place, um, 
we can actually get, you could say, license to operate. So in Ghana, for example, that could be with traditional chiefs, um, community leaders, uh, farmer group leaders, or others. Uh, same in Indonesia, I work a lot with the Kepala Desa, the head of the village, uh, to sort of bring this about. Um, and uh, then that's that's sort of like this contextual license to operate, if you will. But then we have the official powers that be to also collaborate with, and these would be the government, um, the land agencies, um, and these other sort of like inst often institutional actors that are setting standards um, that govern our domain. Um, and in our experience, um, that's worked really well because, you know, if we comply with their needs, <laughs> uh, they will allow us to operate, <laughs> simply put. Um, and, and that's really, um, that's kind of, you could say, uh, the magic that we're able to sort of work with people at the bottom as well as comply with the ones at the top of the system. And, and that's how we um, sort of like try and move forward. Um, yeah, we have developed a mobile solution which um, is able to capture data in the field. Um, we initially started out using uh, Geo ODK, which I think many are, are familiar with, and um, and we think they did a great job uh, with John Nordling and his team to develop that. Uh, but we went away from it eventually just because we learned so much about what what is necessary that we decided to build our own in-house application that could work anywhere, online, offline, and simply um, allow us to really focus on the efficiency of, of, of data capture in the field. And then on the other end, we have a back office that actually cleans the data semi-automatically. Uh, it allows us to process the data as it comes in, uh, check for anomalies, and then effectively um, we can sort of, in, in a sort of clearance system, look at the ones that have to be, be approached and looked at um, and, and dealt with in the field while we're operating in the field. And this makes it a very efficient um, uh, process. Um, we create like uh, dashboards and whatnot where you can sort of, uh, you can see maps of, uh, of the work, etc. cetera. Um, but anyway, let me get to, to the case. This was just so you got a bit of a sense of what kind of company we are. Uh, we're also, we're, we're operating in, in, in Malawi, in Indonesia, in Ghana and Ivory Coast uh, currently uh, and, and based out of Amsterdam. So then we've got the geography covered. Uh, great. So I'd like to talk to you about what I would say is actually, you could at this point, our core business, if you will. Um, and, and this is working in agriculture. So I mentioned earlier that uh, for us being a B2C outfit, so a business to consumer outfit that just sells uh, land rights outright to, to, to smallholders uh, was a challenging setup. And so we looked around to say, who else has an interest in this? And I think this is really interesting when you compare it to the, the SDG conversation we're having today, um, because the most obvious parties that we could find were big food companies, billion dollar companies that are sourcing cocoa and coffee and, uh, and what have you, uh, because they have a lot of challenges. So let's talk a little bit about them. Um, I guess I don't have to even read off the slide here uh, to sort of, um, you know, be apocalyptic about what's going on, but if you're in the food business, uh, you've got you've got your your work cut out, I'd say, um, and land is sort of really an underlying issue in how we deal with land uh, for the producer communities, how we maintain the, our resources and forests, um, and um, and how we basically work towards a more sustainable approach uh, to 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 managing land, and 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 this is increasingly something that. Uh, food companies have to deal with um, uh, before they could sort of ignore it. I'm, I'm sourcing from somebody who's sourcing from somewhere else. And, you know, it's sort of like there was, there was a, a sort of um, a reluctance to take responsibility for that. But that seems to be really shifting now. And you see a lot of these big global brands saying, actually, I want to know exactly where that's being produced because I am, I'm accountable to, to, to my consumers. Um, so... Um, some of these challenges that, that they face are that we have um, challenges in sourcing. Um, so where to source from, or where is it, where do you get reliable sourcing from? Another challenge is that many smallholder farmers are producing at very, very low prices and are risking dropping out of the, 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 the value chain, which means they might not be there to produce your commodity in like five to 10 years from now, which is a serious business risk. Um, and um, at the same time, 
uh, there is both the public and governmental pressure of standards that have to be lived up to. So again, I, I'm not trying to feel sorry for these uh, food companies at all. I'm just trying to paint a picture of where they're coming from and how land rights can actually help them. Because we believe that by secure, securing these land rights, these companies actually can be instrumental in achieving land titling for rural communities where the governments are failing to, to, to offer this service. Um, so again, why is this? Let's, let's look a bit closer. Well, a smallholder farmer will often have a short-term outlook if they don't know what's gonna happen to their land in a year or two from now. They can only plan as long as the next harvest and it's, it's very fair. <laughs> like you wouldn't really necessarily plan any longer if you were gonna lose your house or apartment in a year potentially, right? You wouldn't be hanging pictures on the walls or, or painting. <laughs> so it's, it's, very, it's a very natural way to be, uh, uh, to be thinking. So no investment is made, um, uh, no long-term thinking uh, is, is really taking place. Um, and and this is, this is a, the absolute critical issue and so what we uh, have identified is like three uh, major uh, sort of ways that we can impact both the farmers and the food companies by providing land tenure, changing that mindset. So from, from one angle, it's a data angle. Um, most of these food companies, as I mentioned before, are looking to find out where is that produce coming from? Is it coming from a forest? Is it damaging? Uh, an ecosystem somewhere. Will I have Greenpeace standing knocking on my door next week complaining? You know, I mean, these are, these are, these are some of those concerns. And so by accurately mapping the farms and figuring out the legality of the land ownership, you're able to, to actually ascertain that this, this production is taking place in, in a sustainable way. And then you can also apply traceability standards such as, uh, you know, Fair Trade or Rainforest Alliance or RSPO. Um, uh, but, but, but just the basic data of knowing where stuff is from is key. Uh, an example of this is in the Ivory Coast, where if, if you actually have an official land document, you are guaranteed to be not sourcing from uh, a national forest area. Another issue, which I think is much more interesting than the compliance part, is land tenure increases productivity. You remember I spoke about that mindset before? Well, we know for a fact that when smallholder farmers have uh, a long-term outlook on their plot, when they know that for sure they are able uh, to, to be uh, farming their land five and 10, 20 years from now, they can make long-term investments. Uh, they can take up finance. Uh, they can um, uh, make it attractive and interesting for the next generation to take over their farming activity. And that changes their output in double digit figures. Now, I don't know if, if there is any other, you know, if you, you know, thinking from a corporate um, kind of mindset, they're usually getting like, oh, let's squeeze an extra 1% margin out here. Here we're talking about that we can get 15, 20, 30, 40, 50% increase in yield, which results in, in, in income change uh, for smallholders. And you see that in commodity change, such as, as cocoa uh, and coffee as, as really great examples of that. Um, another thing is that food companies are changing how they uh, are in relationship with their producers. Uh, before they'd be like, yeah, wherever I source from, that's fine. If I can't get it from here, I'll get it from there. But land is getting scarcer um, and uh, will need to, um, yeah, or the companies need to double down on whom they work with and invest more long term. And if you're investing in somebody's livelihood and their own only asset, uh, what we have seen is that uh, farmers reward that with higher loyalty towards those companies and, and it means they're able to work closer together. Uh, so yeah, these are really the, the, the opportunities, uh, getting the data right, uh, the well-being of the producers, and then um, yeah, let's go back to the SDGs, all right? So um, I think we covered most of it, but um, the no poverty, I think, um, uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, the, the some 500 uh, million smallholder farmer families, right, are often on the lower end of the income spectrum, so to speak. So this is where uh, you can have significant impact by helping them increase their income, and land tenure does that. 
Um, the zero hunger is interesting, as mentioned before, uh, uh, with the sort of land scarcity and, and the challenges that we have with the growing population. Um, smallholder farmers are where the yield increases can be had to increase global food, food production. You're not going to increase uh, the, the, the sort of uh, grain production in the Midwest. That is efficient already, right? Or, uh, you know, you, you will need to, to, to get those efficiencies elsewhere. And that will be from the small scale producers. And gender, like really, really, really key. Uh, this is how we really can work on lifting out communities, but I'm probably preaching uh, to, to, to the choir here, but lifting communities uh, out of poverty as well as women get access uh, to those land rights. Um, and overall, and maybe more strategically, looking at the life on land side, where um, uh, which is SDG 15, where you're saying, uh, how do we actually manage those resources, most particularly forests um, that uh, are, are disappearing continuously and at a rapid rate. Smallholder farmers are some of the greatest deforesters in some parts of the world, like Indonesia, for example, uh, due to the fact, going back to SDG 1, they need to expand their land to expand their income. Um, so, so this is connected. And then what I call uh, the SDG that binds them all, and sorry about the Lord of the Rings reference, but um, I think this partnership is really interesting, uh, but I'm gonna get to that in a bit more detail in a second. So where we play a role as Meridia in sort of like outlining these challenges that the food companies have is that they don't know how to deal with the scale of land tenure into tens of thousands of parcels. They basically don't know how to work with a government because they're afraid of corruption. Um, and they're not a, 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 they're not a mapping or titling outfit. So they just can't implement that kind of project on their own. And that's the kind of what Meridia does. We kind of solve these problems for them because we have the technology that can scale. We can work as a reliable partner for, 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 for governments because we can comply with the requirements. Um, and we can work on, on figuring out uh, the, the costs as well. And that's maybe one of the key ingredients here as well. We see that in some, some places we work uh, with a self-paid model. So we just get access to the farmers and the farmers pay their own way, but it's, it'll be in an organized fashion together with a commodity buyer say. In other cases, the company will pay outright for all of the land documentation because they believe in that investment. Um, in other places, it's a hybrid, and you know we can. There are different models, and we really try to make these, uh, uh, you know, custom make these models for the various uh, value chains and, and regions that we're working in. Um, so a couple of examples, and thanks, Paula. <laughs> Here's the, the one you were referencing. Um, so uh, Cadastro International invited us into a partnership with um, the Indonesian government and the Ministry of, 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 of Land there called the BPN uh, to basically test out how we could create a fit for purpose and participative solution to assist the government in scaling up their land titling efforts. Um, and uh, what that basically did was that we, we, we took an approach where we said, why do you need to send a land surveyor or a team of land surveyors to a village if you have a technology, so which is our mobile app on the one hand side, and sufficient training and quality control on the other side? So instead of sending 10 people to, to the village, we would send one or two, and they would basically uh, educate and train a, a, a team of para surveyors. Um, could be 12, 15, 20 people from the community, and they would do all of the, uh, the data collection and thereby um, um, produce their own uh, land titling data. And what, what was interesting on that front was that when um, UGM, uh, the leading technical university in Indonesia, compared it to BPN's own land titling efforts, our quality was equivalent or perhaps better. I won't say that too loudly. But it definitely complied. Uh, so, uh, so that's really exciting to see that it doesn't have to be that expensive either. And another and final example is um, a partnership that we've, we've just launched in, in Ivory Coast. Uh, so we have the Hershey Company, Unilever, uh, we have uh, the Cocoa uh, Horizons Foundation, which is part of Barry, Barry Calabao, they're the world's biggest cocoa bar. Um, for those who aren't into commodity companies. 
Anna Four, which is the Rural Ministry of, of Lands. And uh, we're all partnered together. Uh, we have basically built an effort whereby we create a, a sort of sector specific consortium to provide affordable land titling to uh, the smallholders that are there. And we're gradually inviting more and more companies into this. And this is really interesting to see because these companies, they want this land titling to take place because they believe in these productivity increases that we just talked about. They believe it'll hit all of these commitments they're making in the SDGs. Um, but, you know, they struggle to, you know, how are we actually going to make that happen? Uh, and that's how such a, a multi-party partnership can happen between corporates, between the government, and then uh, like a private sector party like us that can deliver the solution. Um, and so, yeah, we're very excited about that and we'll hope to be posting uh, results on that. Um, we just finished our first year and, and we'll be posting results on that uh, uh, in 2021 as, as we start our early scale program. Anyway, I'm definitely running over time, I think. So, so do uh, let me know if there are any questions and, and thanks again for having me. Thank you very much, uh, Simon. Uh, very interesting presentation. Very inspiring. Uh, I would like to thank to all presenters. And uh, now we will go through the questions. We have half, half an hour time to this for discussion. So I think uh, plenty of time to share opinion, experience, to discuss uh, and to see how we go for our future. So. Uh, you have seen the chat. I will go with the first questions, which are to Crit Lemon. Crit, I would like to ask you to unmute your microphone, or I will do it for you. Let me see. No, you should do it yourself, please. Uh, and the, um, the question is from uh, Harmut Miller. So the question um, is... Miller? Yes. I, th I think we could even let Hartman, if he wants to extend on it, we can let him talk direct, if you like. If you can unmute if him, yeah, it would to. be the best, yeah. please. Yes. Perfect. Hartman, you can, you can talk if you like. <laughs> Just unmute your microphone, please. Now? Can yes, you hear me? perfect. Okay, yes. great. So first of all, hello to everyone. I'm really happy to see you all here. Uh, it's great, great session, really wonderful spirit, wonderful presentations. This is the first thing. And uh, the second is, uh, yeah, Crit, I uh, would like to ask you, I just wrote it in the, in the uh, question, but I can ask you uh, about the LADM model. So as we see, we, we made some, some investigations in COVID times about the statistical data, health data, how to combine everything. And of course, uh, spatial unit related information is would be excellent, as we saw in many presentations. Is there uh, an idea or is there a practical way how to extract uh, data from the LADM model and uh, use it in, in, in statistics, combine it with health data to identify vulnerable groups in informal settlements. For instance, in Colombia, they did things like that. Do you have any approach to, to do that? Yes, uh, thank you, Hartwood. Uh, there is an approach. We, we are thinking uh, about uh, the sustainable development goals. They are monitored and uh, achievements are measured. So there are, there are indicators have been defined and many of them are related, let's say, to, to land related issues. I am not here. Can anybody else hear what Chris is saying? Reed, can you no, talk closer hear. to the microphone? Can you hear me now? A little bit better if you can improve. It seems that there is. You an went echo. underwater. <laughs> Maybe if we all turn our mics while Crit talk, talks. Can you hear me now? Yes. So thank you, Albert, for your question. Uh, we, we are thinking uh, to use LDM to monitor 
the, the sustainable development goals because many of the land indicators In LDM. LDM could be applied on intermediate uh, land rates, and you can compare special use of LDM to, to other uh, statistical types of special units. And of course, you can do that for the, for the land and the land rights, but also for uh, healthcare, vaccination, and so on, because many GISs are used in, 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 are used in, that, in that area. And uh, that, that means that, that points are allocated to places where people live, and those points can be extended to other types of special units uh, later. So the answer is uh, yes, we are thinking in this direction. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, Millie? Armut, does this answer your question and you had the continuation because I have seen quite a lot in the chat from you? Do you have well, that was, no, that actually I, I made some mistakes and putting uh, putting more questions than I actually wanted to do. So struggling a bit with the technology here. But uh, I, I had a pro some problems to, to, to understand, but the main message was at the end. Yes, we are thinking in that direction. And uh, you, you, you agree, Grit, uh, that that could be beneficial or no? So you did not hear my answer, Hartmut? Parts of it, parts of it. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm sorry for that. No, the answer is very clear. We, are, we, we, we try to establish a link between uh, national and local LDM implementations and monitoring the sustainable development goal. And this example can be used for, for many other uh, applications. Okay. And do you have a, a concrete a concrete idea? For me, it's a bit, at the moment, it's at the conception level. Okay, it's clear, yes, you have the, you have the diagrams, you have the glass diagrams, that's, that's obvious. Do you see any uh, concrete uh, yeah, the... approaches to, to do it, to, to take such data out and to use it for, yeah, for example, for, for healthcare or so? Yeah, let's say the, the, the SDG indicators, uh, I think they are very clear. Uh, you cannot hear me. No. There is a problem with the sound. Mm -hmm. There was a recommendation, Crit, from Amir to maybe turn off your camera to save some bandwidth maybe in the connection. I don't know if it helps. Okay, can you hear me better now? Yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. And then sorry for this. Um, yeah. So we, we look at the, the SDG indicators, and, and uh, some of them uh, let's say are almost equals to equal to attributes in the in the LADM. For example, when it is about women's access uh, to land, and when it is about healthcare, I know many applications where point-related uh, geographic information. And it is about structures where people are, are, are living, small places where people are living, uh, to link those points to, to let's say, monitoring vaccination uh, uh, programs. So then uh, there will be a, a kind of ID painted on, on, on this uh, structure, and that is a link uh, to the vaccination uh, data. And of course, this can be extended later. Uh, to, to more complete uh, land administration, also for this type of, uh, of areas. So I see many applications. And sometimes there are not points, but uh, the, 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 the roads in those areas. You, you yeah. Hey, we lost you again, Crit. I'm happy with the answer. It's okay. good enough. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks a lot. From, from time to time, you, we are use, losing you. 
So partly we heard your answer, at the end we lost you. Um, let's see now if we will manage to understand. Uh, there is a question from Brent Jones about the schedule for 2021. Do you have some concrete virtual schedule? And if Brent wants to, to add more additional questions to this, please let us know. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll add a little bit to that, you know, given the yeah. fact that uh, none of us are traveling and we're um, pretty comfortable with these online forms, perhaps we can use this as an opportunity to accelerate the development. Yes, uh, thank you, Brent. Uh, there is a schedule, that is the ILTC 211 uh, meeting schedule. I can see from Paul's face that you cannot hear me. So it's not at all. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Now it's better, shortly. Okay. Yes, there is a meeting schedule. That is the ISO TC211 uh, schedule. They meet uh, twice a year. And uh, FIG is in, involved. And we, we have a delegation. And you can be involved in that uh, brand. Oh, I'd have somebody much smarter than me do that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say somebody from uh, from your company. Yeah. yeah thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me see. Yes. Uh, so we have one uh, more comment, mainly from uh, Stick and Mark. Maybe he oh, can. Uh, uh, say Miller, just going to jump in there, Miller. Um, Amir uh, actually had a question that's a bit higher up. Um, uh, yes. We skipped over it. Is so he, we'll just, uh, he, if, if he wants, yeah, I'll just let him, him, him yeah. Yeah. would be the best. Yeah. Thank you. Amir? Thank you, everybody. Yes. Uh, thank you, everybody. Very inspiring today, um, all presenters. I, I just wanted to, uh, when we go to do a system design, we usually start with the business requirements, the workflows, the products, the title maps, and so on that needs to be produced from the system. And we don't start from the database with a conceptual or physical database. Um, and we use storyboards and other processes to define those um, nowadays. Is there any intentions for the LADM standard to also include a list of workflows? And then from that, how those would be reflected in the information model, basically? Yes, that, that, thank you, Amir. Thank you. Uh, that is a requirement for, for let's say, uh, implementation of interoperability between different uh, organizations. There will be attention to, to workflows, and there will also be attention to uh, business uh, requirements. For the first edition of LDM, there were about 50, 55 experts from all of the all of the room defining those requirements. Okay, so thank you, Krita. I, I didn't hear it all, but if I understand correctly, it is already based on a inventory of multiple business requirements from multiple countries, right? Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. And if I may add something here, uh, in in case you did not hear a quick answer. <laughs> so yeah, LADM edition one was based on the requirements, but uh, a quick also present uh, briefly that there are new requirements that we would like to meet with the second edition. So we update these requirements, and based on those requirements, we build the um, the conceptual model, and then the rest. And about the workflows also, I don't know if this really answers, but uh, there is a provision to include also processes uh, in uh, part six at the implementation stage. Great, thank you, Patricia and Kurt. Okay, thank you. Uh, and now maybe finally, if uh, um, Stig Enemar can join us and say his... Uh, command and his question to Chris. Stick, can you un unmute? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Now, I really enjoyed this, uh, this session, an uh, excellent presentation. So it's wonderful and also great feeling to be um, with the community again. So thank you all. Now, uh, I, I would like to pose a little bit more general uh, question to at least to, to Frank and uh, Paul and, uh, and Simon. Um, talking about you, you all talk about this term uh, secure land tenure right but uh, there are quite a lot of meanings around that i mean 
it can be uh, legitimate or it can be actually uh, uh, legal. Um, and um, but this kind of secure land tender, if you look at the outcome of uh, pro poor land regulation versus fit for purpose land, land regulation, um, how do you see it? And um, do you see um, these two approaches as uh, competing or as uh, complementary? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Stig, for uh, posing that question. I think a really good topic to further elaborate on um, and to discuss uh, about. Um, I think when, when you pose this question, this is where I think of the sheet of Rudolf uh, Steiger in 2019 with the plenary session, where it said, it's not easy. This is where the, the not easy part is. Um, governments are responsible for um, documenting the, 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 the land tenure and just securing the land rights and to register them. Um, but they don't always accommodate all types of tenure in the systems. And that's where the issue comes in. And that's where the fit for purpose uh, approach and the concept comes in to ensure that these uh, other types of tenure um, are documented and recognized. Um, but that means that they, they are in a different uh, aspect of the continuum of land rights. Um, and so from the national level, there should be a movement to accept these um, uh, tenure types um, in the continuum. So that, need, that re requires a change in the, in the legal framework. Uh, but that's, that's, the, that's the challenging part uh, when implementing fit for purpose land administration approaches. We see a lot of um, um, uh, activities on the ground with the, the, the recordation of rights, but how do they fit up Fit, fit, fit in the, the bigger uh, system in, in the country, uh, in the bigger framework in the continuum of land rights. Um, so they should be complementary, but that's not the easy, uh, easy part. And to add to that, just one more, that's where the surveying profession can definitely have a big role in making sure that this um, is, is uh, tackled um, and that we learn from the experiences uh, from the projects that have been already executed. Thanks, Paula. And maybe I'll just add, add a little bit on that and, and, and perhaps build on it a bit, because I, I think we see it very much the same as, as complementary and ideally they both align. But what we, we also see sometimes with partners is that they have to go for the secure enough choice, right? What can get them the greatest amount of security at the lowest cost and at a, at a, at a, reason, in a reasonable time? And that's where sometimes there's the disconnect. If the government approaches don't allow for that type of tenure, if perhaps seen as too complicated or, or uh, expensive, um, there becomes that disconnect and the communities are willing to settle for that, that secure and secure enough approach. Um, yeah, so that, that's where we'd see them coming together. Um, yeah, I think I can jump on the bandwagon as well, uh, though from our perspective, it's a question of, um, yeah, I think being compliant again, maybe to, not that it's the right term, uh, but let's just do an example. So, for example, when we work in Ghana, uh, we're always doing some kind of formalization, right? Um, our interest um, as a provider of such a service is that it's reliable um, and it can be used and relevant as well. Um, so, for example, in Ghana with a cocoa farm, I would never try and sell them a land title. It would cost them thousands of dollars and they wouldn't have any benefit from it. Um, but if you get them a customary land certificate, whereby the chief has signed off on, and it's typically a lease of, let's say, 50 to 99 years, which is transferable, um, then, you know, then that's also, that's really good in their situation, and it'll cost them 100 bucks. Uh, so, so just, just as, as comparison. So I think it's about finding the relevant service uh, that is useful at that time. But then the trick is, how do you, at, at some point, uh, how, how can you be sure uh, as you continue, as you continue along the continuum, <laughs> um, then um, that the work that has been done before is useful in the future or, or at that point in time that you want to continue. And I, I think that that's, that's an interesting question. So what we do is we try uh, and make sure that our, 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 our documents are sort of like forward compatible 
So let's say you can use the same, uh, you can use the same data again for the next level. Uh, and that then you would only have to pay for the difference uh, plus all of the government fees, most likely in most places. Uh, but uh, you would easily be able to upgrade, thus always making sure that, that the burden is, is light on, 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 the, on the, the, in this case, a, a farmer or landholder. And Simon, just to, 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 to verify on that or to further build upon that, when you have built it for the next step or to build forward on that, has there been the linkage also with the government or the national level in that design for that? Yeah, well, that's the trick, right? So we have to always, we try and pay attention. Uh, so let's just use our example from Ghana again to do a, a customary land document since most land, some 80% in Ghana or more is customarily held and controlled. You know, we could hand out land documents and or certificates that are customary left, right and center in Ghana without the government being involved because it's not in their jurisdiction, right? Only when it becomes, uh, moves into the, the statutory domain. Um, uh, so, um, so we could ignore what the government says, but we don't. We really try and say, so what, what, is the, what does the Lands Commission want? What are their standards? Where are they going? And now there's an, this new land law coming through in Ghana, for example. And so we try and be proactive around saying, so let's integrate that, be it, it could be on the data side, it could be a compliance issue, it could be um, really technical surveying uh, issues uh, so that we adapt to that. Um, but that's always a negotiation somehow as a, as a, as a party uh, that you have to see like what, what, what makes sense at that point um, uh, in time, because we don't know what the government's going to do in 10 years time, right? You can't be forever forward compatible. Um, but yeah, so in Ghana, we do do that. And, and we really do try and make sure that if somebody at some point wants to move from say a customer certificate to a statutory deed, then well, uh, two thirds of the work has already been done and they just need to go to the regional surveyor's office and, and get it processed. And they don't need to necessarily do the surveying again, for example, which is prohibitively expensive for a single, single parcel, for example. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Simon. I would like uh, to give the floor. We have two raised hands which are waiting <laughs> for us to give them the floor to speak. So please, uh, first, Christine um, Maltes. Yes, please. Christine. Yeah, my question, my question is to Simon. I was, uh, I understand the gain expected by corporate entities and governments, but I was wondering if there is a plan to expose the traceability of kind of the ethics of the chain, including the land ownerships of the farmers to the consumers. They can put pressure on companies to contribute to on this objective, I think. I mean, you're really barking up my tree on that one. I'd love for land rights to become a consumer driven item, uh, an issue. Uh, that could that could really help put further pressure on companies to to put this higher uh, in their budgets, <laughs> so that this can be done. Um, uh, I think we're not quite there yet, um, because I think for the reason that you know land rights is boring and and uninteresting, it's administrative and and all of that. Um, but and I think we as a sector, in a way, possibly us here, but also maybe some of the more you know. Um, advocacy folks, um, the, the Landessas of this world, um, who are doing great work. Uh, I think that we, together as a, as a larger sector, need to be better at articulating um, how this, uh, like, uh, or creating language that can be used vis-a-vis -vis the consumers, because that's, I think, when you'll get that response. Um, an example of that would be child labor, it's pretty simple. Nobody thinks child labor is a good idea anywhere and no company wants to find it in their supply chain and they'll do anything to get rid of it, right? Now, uh, 
if you could think about that as a fundamental um, issue that could also, like which land titling is, which can benefit in so many different ways. If we can find a way of articulating that clearly, which I'm clearly struggling to do right now, <laughs> uh, then I think um, that will change and that traceability will take place and it, it can be much, much more transparent because the systems are, are there for it. It's, it's more uh, the pressure needs to come on. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, let's go to the next uh, raised hand, Gabriel. Can you please uh, switch on your mic? Hi, yeah. everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate all of the um, presentation. Uh, that was very great, uh, good. And um, Simon did a good uh, um, presentation about uh, potential other uh, partner uh, in this kind of uh, land rights, land title things. But first, I think we have to consider that uh, we always talk uh, about land rights and everything like that, but we have to tell the people that not only we, we have right, we have restriction in the land and we have responsibilities. So we can uh, we can just, uh, it, it's kind of very sexy in a way to say uh, right, but we have also responsibilities and restriction when you have a piece of land. So this is the first thing we, we, we have to consider. The other thing I think fit for purpose, uh, and I think it's, uh, for many years uh, we are discussing about fit for purpose, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's very ambitious and, uh, and it's, it's great. I think I, I agree with the, the idea or the concept of fit for purpose, but the problem is uh, until now we only have this kind of uh, implementation only for as a pilot. So we can continue like that as a pilot. I think we have to, in one way or another, influence the government because if the government of each country is not involved in this uh, fit for purpose or this idea of partnership in order to give a, formalize the land, uh, we are continuing to do pilot uh, project forever. And uh, we have for hundreds of years of doing that. So we need to, uh, and because I agree with uh, Christian about the fit for purpose and uh, about Paula, but uh, I think we need to, if we would like to really achieve something, we have to, um, in one way or another, uh, influence not only the government, but also the, um, the financial institutions, like a financial organization, like the, the, the lender of money, like World Bank, uh, et cetera. Uh, if they don't put this as a, as a, um, main uh, issue like uh, using the fit for purpose and a collaborative way to formalize the, the land, um, uh, we are not going to go very far from, from now. So my uh, question I have, I'm sorry about this long introduction, is about how uh, we can influence uh, different government in order to um, to get involved in the idea of formalize the land because there is a lot of problems, not only uh, in uh, rural areas and uh, urban areas, but also with indigenous people, like everywhere in the world, you can see even in Canada, in, in Canada, and uh, we have problems with the, with the right of, uh, of uh, the water uh, in the fisheries uh, right now. Uh, and, uh, and this is one of the right we need uh, as a surveyor, uh, we need to be uh, able to answer uh, all of these uh, people with, with uh, and influence the, the polit uh, politicians. So my who, question who is- want, Who wants to answer the question? <laughs> <laughs> oh, to, for whom is your question? <laughs> <laughs> so the question is how we can uh, press to influence uh, more the government and the international uh, financial organization in order to go ahead with put for purpose, uh, fit for purpose and uh, other ways to formalize the land. Yeah. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah. Can I <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I heard. OK, uh, thank you for your question, uh, Gabriel, and also your engagement and, and pressing for uh, things to, to move forward. I, uh, I applaud that and uh, support that, uh, certainly. If I look back uh, on, on the publications that we have, like with the uh, 
presentation of the concept that was 2014, only six years ago. Um, you, was, you see now the first implementations um, at local level, but also good examples at national level with uh, Colombia, Mozambique, uh, Benin, Indonesia, Nepal, where they're really um, um, also at national level government supporting uh, the approach and bring forward examples. And that's where I think the crucial part is. Um, I mean, the arguments and the foundation is present, it's there. It's now about learning from these uh, experiences and with that creating um, a catalyst, yeah, or to use it as a catalyst. How do you say that? Catalysator? I think you understand. <laughs> Uh, yeah. yeah, as a catalyst, um, um, where we can take the lessons learned of these examples, and that's what I was trying to aim for. I think it's really now the momentum to 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 gather all these best practices and to get uh, the, the these lessons learned out to um, uh, our community, but also to a donor community where they uh, can take these uh, examples on board or be inspired. Like oh, Ray, okay, this really uh, uh, works uh, in practice and even works better than we anticipated or has good examples that can work in this context. So uh, that's where I see in the coming uh, time, um, really um, uh, an output that will further encourage the implementation uh, of fit for purpose land administration approaches. Thank you, Paula. Krit, do you want to ask, add something you wanted also to say or? Uh, Mila, if you say yes, that you can understand what I say, then I will bring my opinion. <laughs> I felt it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you know, we develop so many things as a surveyor's community. And, and uh, but it seems that the outside world doesn't know, or maybe doesn't know enough what we are doing. Uh, an example is this, this women's access to land. There is a publication already 20 years ago from Agneta mm -hmm. Erickson. And I think she was maybe one of the first uh, in, in this area. And it was, uh, we have a very nice publication, read it, be surprised, it's 20 years old. Uh, but it, it seems that we are not successful in, in communicating uh, uh, what, what we did uh, find there. And, and uh, the same is maybe true for this fit for purpose uh, approach and also social tenure and, and, and uh, let's say converting social tenure to legal tenure and, and, and so on. Uh, there are many, many developments which are, let's say, FIG uh, developments, but we need more communication and acceptance by the other uh, parts of the United Nations and, and so on. I have the feeling that they are not always, uh, how to say, uh, friendly when it is about uh, uh, our, our ideas. So communication is the, the key to success. Thank you very Can much, uh, Chris. Can I say something? Yes, yes Gabrielle, this is Amy. I, I totally agree with what you're saying. I think we need, as a community to get beyond sort of the pilot kind of um, scale that we're at and, and start to build that. And I think we do start, we're starting to see that more and more. Uh, just a couple of comments. I think as Cadasta looks forward, uh, we're looking at a few things. One is where is their government openness to innovation? Where are governments looking for change and looking for bringing data, ground level data up into the system where we can uh, push data into uh, government land information systems, whether they're at the district level, at the state level, at the national level. So I think the government openness and willingness to engage is one piece of it. Uh, and there are some countries more open than others. For example, we're working in Uganda. We have an MOU with the Ministry of Land, and we're working with them to issue uh, certificates of customary occupancy in, in uh, 10 districts. So getting that buy-in is important and mo a lot of our projects have government collaboration. The second thing is, you know, building that ecosystem or in, in a given country or in a given state or region where you're bringing in these other actors. I think Simon gave a good example of that in the cocoa sector, but bringing in uh, multi-sectoral actors and building the ecosystem to start pushing those models uh, uh, up to government level and also to scale, scaling them. And then of course the community buy-in piece. If it's completely government driven and the community isn't engaging, that's an issue. We've got to get both uh, 
uh, community level verification and, and uh, legitimacy as well as government. And then finally, you know, engaging the private sector where their interests and where their interests align. And I think, you know, all of those, all of those efforts are going to um, really start to build that in scale some of these things that we're already working on. Thank you, I mean, very nice addition. Since we are running a bit out of time, I just want to give a last final words and comments from uh, Brent. Uh, Brent, we have, please uh, start from you and uh, stick on a mark and we will finish the session with that. Brent? Uh, thanks very much, Mila. I think it's important that we remember the continuum of rights and what we're trying to do with Fit for Purpose is secure rights where they are on the continuum. And then how do we move down the continuum? I think the cadastra diagram that showed uh, customary on the bottom and government on the top and, and that tier in the middle, I think that's how we have to think. That tier, that middle tier changes from, from community to community, but secure what's there and then put the infrastructure in place to formalize. And I agree with, uh, with Daniel Roberge's uh, comment as well. You know, a cadaster, a cadaster does not have to necessarily document formal title. It can, it can be a government document of the rights as they exist. And that's how I'd like to close. Thanks, Mila. Thank you very much, uh, Brent. Very nice addition. Can we please uh, final words from Stig? <laughs> well, thank you. What an honor. <laughs> yeah. Now, <laughs> um, now actually, um, I just want to say that we actually we actually do know that this uh, fit for person purpose concept works. Right? We have a lot of a lot of pilots, and uh, and we have all the activities that Cadastra and uh, and Meridia is uh, is working on. And so we know it works, and um, so it's a matter of how how do we make government to take it on at a at a national scale, right? So and that takes to develop this kind of strategy as, as, as Paula referred to in, in Nepal. And currently they're trying to develop such a strategy in, in Uganda. And that's actually just about accepted. It's about 20 million uh, land parcels um, we can uh, do in about five years uh, and uh, for the cost of 10 US dollars per parcel. Mm -hmm. Plus I would add another 10 US dollars for actually building the capacity to develop sustainable institutions. That's the key thing. But I would like to add one thing from your um, great presentation, especially what Simon said about this um, building, uh, delivering not only um, a secure tenure or, or uh, in whatever form it may be, but develop a kind of package, right? So that you can actually um, use it for investment, for agricultural improvement or, or whatever it is, so that um, that um, the, um, the land, um, the people can actually see that they get something, not only a piece of paper, but they get something that they, they can work with, right? And if the government can understand that, I think we have, we have a way in. And um, so I would like to propose actually, we, we develop a kind of a tour in developing countries to uh, to address governments to uh, and the key stakeholders, the surveyors, the, the financial sector and the key stakeholders has to get on board at an early stage to make this really work work and uh, and to get this approved by, by government for, for final implementation. So uh, let's work together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stink. I think this is quite a good ending for this uh, session. Uh, I would like to thank to all the presenters. It was a wonderful session. Thank also to FHE office for making it possible. Uh, and to all of you attendees, thank you very much for your participation, for your questions, for your activities. Uh, I would like to welcome you to join us also in session 10, 11. For some of us, it's in the middle of the night. So please welcome, even if it's so late. Uh, and uh, I think session eight is still running. So if you're enthusiastic to join there, please welcome there to join. Thank you very much for all of you and um, take care. <laughs> all the best. Goodbye. <laughs>